All right, we'll get going here. So, um, got that current homework that's due what next Tuesday by the end of the day. Um, you can turn it in in class or um, upload to Canvas as usual. I should have all those third homeworks graded, so you should see your grade on Canvas for that third homework. Um, should be up there now. Also, um, we will have one last final fifth homework. Um, I'll probably get that out next Tuesday after class. And then that will be due kind of the end of that week, that Friday before exam week. Okay, So we've really only got like two weeks left of class. Um, I'll kind of finish up, I think, today, a lot of college stuff, and then kind of talk about um, bringing some topics that vary a little bit, uh, but are still related to kind of sports economics uh, those last two weeks. And um, as we get closer to that final, I'll probably post some practice exam stuff next week as well, and maybe have a, a possibility for like a, a review session that's maybe scheduled um, outside of class. But I'll kind of mention that as we get a little bit closer to, to final exam week, okay? Any questions for me before we kind of jump back into things? So we left off, talked about some supply differences that could, cause some variation um, in the wages that we would see if we had a free and open labor market in the NCAA, right? So we'll talk through, I guess I'll have my animations on here, but we'll talk through some additional kind of um, topics that are related to kind of payer, players being paid at the college level. So, you know, things that maybe we, we wouldn't think about are things like labor laws, right? So that might impact the number of hours that a player could work. Um, we might think about even minimum wages, right? I don't think they'd be binding necessarily for, for NCAA players, but, but we, they would be subject to all those laws. We can even think about the cooperation of the NCAA with the NFL and NBA currently. Um, you know, in most industries, this would be considered you know, to go against antitrust laws, right? They're in two separate markets and they're trying to coordinate or you know, coordinate actions with each other and to really exploit their labor potentially. Um, and we'll talk, come back to this in just a second. And we also kind of have potential restrictions of, of roster size, right? Right now they have, you know, a restriction on that. Once it's a free and open labor market, you can't simply restrict the number of, of workers that are in a certain market. And so we might see kind of those go away as well. So we'll kind of focus for a second on this idea of the NCAA working with the professional leagues like NBA and NFL to, you know, do a certain, you know, set requirements that a player has to be a certain number of years out of high school, right? Like this is, uh, I forget the, what currently it's just one year in, in for the NBA. Uh, and I think it's, is it one year, two years for college football? I forget, I forget off the top of my head, but right, we can think about there are some restrictions. So how is that going to kind of benefit both sides? Right? So we can think about for the professional leagues, how is this cooperation going to impact even wages that we see paid to players in the professional leagues, right? So we'll think about the benefits to both. So if we just think about high quality uh, players, we're thinking about players that would leave NCAA to go to the NFL or the NBA right out of high school, right? So these are, are, are likely gonna be high quality players. So we're thinking about a market for high quality players here. doesn't matter which sport. So if we were just looking at players of exactly the same quality, right, a little bit of, a, of an assumption there, right, we can imagine that every single quality level, there will essentially be like a different labor market. So we're looking at one of them. Well, without any restrictions, these players leave high school, they can, they can join this league. We would expect to kind of see equilibrium quantity and wages be where supply is equal to demand for that player. So What's interesting to think about is, well, if right, we put this restriction that high school players can't leave, right, and go right to the professional leagues, what that's essentially going to do is reduce the supply of those high quality. So we can think about this was uh, kind of with the restriction. You're going to see fewer high quality players because they're going to have to go to college for a year or, or for two years, depending on what time period we're looking at or what, what sport we're looking at. And so it's gonna restrict the supply of high quality players. So for those that remain, 
You can think about the number of higher quality players we see in the NBA potentially goes down, right? But the wages for the players who meet that restriction, right? Who can supply their labor to the NBA because they are more than one or two years removed from high school would actually end up kind of receiving a higher wage. So the players union actually fights for this. Might seem kind of weird. I mean, you know, until those collegiate players are in the NBA, the union, you know, doesn't have to go to bat for them. And by preventing them from automatically joining, we may potentially see that the current high quality players that exist in the NBA would actually, as a result of this lower supply, receive a higher wage. So the NBA likes this, or the NFL likes these restrictions. And we can almost think about what's really happening um, at the collegiate. We don't even have to necessarily draw a graph for it. We can think about at the collegiate level, the cost of these players is, is pretty minimal, right? Now, when it comes to like the cost of recruiting, right? And if I'm just giving them a tuition, right? We kind of talked about as long as those two conditions are met, it's essentially like cost-free to the university. But these other minimal costs of, of, you know, you can kind of think about the coach, really the average cost is spread across all the players. And so for lower quality players, the amount that these colleges are spending may be actually above some of those low quality players uh, value, right? Value the marginal wins of labor that they're adding. However, if there's a lot of these high quality players, they're essentially the same cost. Now, maybe the recruiting costs are a little bit higher, but when we're looking at the actual value of the marginal product that comes from the additional wins that that player would bring in, well, that's significantly higher than my lower quality kind of bench players. And so for the NCAA, they now with this restriction are getting access to these high quality players, right? Who they, yeah, they only have them for a year or two, but for that year or two, they're going to be paying them significantly lower than the value that they're bringing in. Right? So both kind of leagues would like this. And I can tell one to point out here that this is, you know, the professional leagues like this as well, right? At least the players that are in, in the professional leagues. Okay? Any questions on that, that idea? Yeah. So, um, you know, potentially we see fewer players in the NBA at a higher wage, right? So higher wage, fewer players at the NBA level. We could also think about the number of games that are played. So currently the NCAA kind of has, you know, determines whether or not a team can be, you know, belong to the, the FCS or FBS in football. And we kind of see the current number, right? So if I had a free and open labor market, how could the number of games or the number of teams change? Right? Well, if we think about the marginal cost of each additional win, well, if I want to add talent now, if I have a free and open labor market, I can't just give them the value of a tuition or, or whatever it is. I, I actually am paying them a wage. And so my marginal costs go from being offering a tuition remission, which was essentially a cost of zero, as long as those two, two conditions were met, that we didn't have a cap on enrollment or that the student would have went there otherwise. So our marginal costs are going to go up. Right? Well, if marginal costs increase, right, or just costs overall, we can think about some of these programs that were previously having positive profits may now actually, you know, if that increase was enough, may actually experience negative profits, which in the long run, we have negative profits, that firm or team would decide to leave the market. So by increasing these costs, we may actually drive some of the teams, right, and out of the, the league and also decrease the number of games. So there's a couple of different ways we can look at this. So the first is just to think about the number of games overall, right? So the number of games, or you could even think about the optimal number of teams. Those two are, you know, one is really just a function of the other, right? Um, that we're thinking about for each game, there's some dollar amount associated with how much the NCAA would benefit. So this kind of would be their demand curve, whatever the marginal benefit of adding an additional team or playing an additional game would be to the, to the NCAA. But there's also some marginal costs, right? And so by allowing a free and open labor market, what's gonna to happen to the marginal costs, right? Well, now every single team is gonna to have to increase how much they're spending on players. So we would see kind of this decrease in supply, right? Because if supply is representing marginal costs and marginal costs would go up, 
at every single number of teams, and I kind of have this decrease in overall supply. Right? This is the idea that, you know, before where it might have been profitable for a school to have a, a football program, it no longer is because the revenues haven't changed, the costs have just went up. So you can think about, you know, think about the optimal, I guess, number of games or number of teams, either one would be kind of, kind of work the same. We might actually see that with these increasing labor costs, we actually see that the equilibrium number of teams or games being played would actually go down. Okay. So that's one way of thinking about how a free and open labor market could impact the number of teams that we see or the number of games that we see being played at the collegiate level. Okay. Another way to think about this, because this is more of like an aggregate supply and aggregate demand, right? We're looking at the number of you know, the teams here. If I think about one individual team, maybe it, it works a little bit different. I can think about why would a team decide to leave and thinking about the, you know, the profits, marginal cost versus marginal revenues. So are we okay with this before I switch out this slide? Okay. So we wanna think about this at a team level. Right? It may have been, and this is, uh, I guess something that we haven't completely looked at yet, but if I've got, the demand for a sport, and then I think about so how do I want to make sure that I show this. So maybe before, we had marginal costs associated with playing a different number of games. So this is for one specific like team. And you know, costs are relatively low, and the NCAA is setting the number of games. So, you know, maybe even the equilibrium point would actually be past the you know 12 games or whatever the NCAA is kind of ha having you play. Right? But what could happen with you know allowing these teams to pay players? Well, that's going to increase my marginal cost. You know, I it likely isn't going to be this dramatic for every single team, but there could be a scenario where if the marginal costs shift enough, right? or they increase enough, well, now the optimal number of games is zero, right? I, I shouldn't have a team, right? Now, this is probably true for a lot of smaller sports. Um, so how do these small sports like still operate, even though we know that the marginal costs of, you know, providing, a, I don't know, what's a good one, maybe, I don't know. I don't want to pick on any sport, but maybe something like uh, even wrestling, right? In a lot of areas of the country, it's not a very popular sport, Right, there is some demand, but if I then have to pay my players, maybe the optimal thing to do is actually, well, the costs are now too high because I'm not earning near enough revenues based off the current demand. And so profits aren't possible and the team no longer exists. Right? So currently what, what occurs is even if we think about a team that has, so here's our demand curve, and let's say, given the costs, I don't know, maybe this team, the optimal number is really only to play four games. Well, they have to play 12 in order to kind of have a football team and belong to whatever conference they do and play at the uh, you know, FBS level. And so maybe the school subsidizes them. Right? So when we talked about positive externalities, um, I, I, don't, I know we talked about this with taxes, but we use taxes right, to correct the market for negative externalities. We can also use subsidies to correct the market for positive externalities. So the idea is that when I'm subsidizing something, when for each game that's being played, it's essentially like, well, I have whatever my marginal benefit was before, plus this additional amount given, given to me by you know, the school. So it's almost like we've got subsidies, right, currently. So we could think about, we'll call this, Two. It's almost like the demand curve gets shifted up because now the marginal benefits aren't just or whatever they were before, plus this additional subsidy that the university is giving me. So that can push the optimal number of games out to you know whatever the number of games that, that is required from the schedule. Right? So this might not be as relevant for like football, right? But you could think about you know lesser sports that don't generate as much revenue. The way that they stay in business, right, is they get these subsidies, which essentially is like a shift outward in that demand. Um, how do I want else do I want to think about this? So we've got um, these subsidies that exist, but you can imagine, you know, 
if those labor costs increase enough, even with these subsidies, maybe we, you know, some of these teams don't actually find it profitable to kind of remain in the NCAA uh, in whatever sport that we're looking at. Right? So even with subsidies, these shifts, these increases in our labor costs might drive some of the teams out of the market. Right? I guess that's the, the kind of takeaway from the end, right? Two questions there before we kind of move on. So, uh, what else do I have here? So, competing inside. Oh, um, we talked about kind of the number of teams, higher costs, decrease the number of teams, right? We can also think about differences across programs, right? So, we think about we have this free and open labor market. Then, yes, for some players, they would definitely be better off than what their current situation is, maybe even if they're still, you know, just receiving a tuition remission. So, for High quality players, right? That means that marginal wins that, that's coming from that labor. And we think about, I can just write it down here. If we remember that our demand curve for labor is really the marginal revenue per win multiplied by the marginal wins that comes from adding that additional unit of labor. So this was really a way, right? The marginal wins that a player at adds, that's really capturing their quality level. So for higher quality players, they're going to have, you know, teams will have a higher demand for them. Right? They'd be willing to pay more for that higher quality player than a low quality player. So that's going to predict that wages for those high quality players are going to be relatively high, right? Because that, because that demand curve shifts up, our equilibrium wage increases. So for these high quality star players, we can imagine they're probably going to be better off receiving a wage than their old tuition remission. However, for like lower quality backup players, their marginal wins are that they add are relatively low. Well, then their equilibrium wage could potentially be below that value, right? Or the total compensation value they were getting from having that tuition remission, maybe some room and board, maybe a small stipend, right? So for some players, like they would love this idea of, you know, a free and open labor market being paid a higher wage, as opposed to kind of the lower quality players may still find it optimal to kind of receive that tuition remission as opposed to, you know, just accepting whatever wage that the teams would be willing to pay. Them. Does that make sense? It's kind of, kind of already talked about this in, in a different context, just higher quality players, we expect higher wages, right? And just like we were thinking about players in different sports, right, maybe a player in football, it's more likely the wage is going to be greater than the tuition remission. If they play bowling, it's less likely, right? And so the tuition remission would actually be more attractive to those, those student athletes who are bowlers as opposed to football players. Same kind of idea here. We're just thinking about within the sport of football, high versus low quality. Well, just like the marginal revenue per win, it's going to shift our demand curve, right? There's two components in that demand that can shift our demand curve. The marginal revenue per win, and if it's easier to think about, it's generally, you know, just if a sport is higher revenue generating. And the second thing is the quality of the player, that, that marginal wins that comes from that, adding that unit of labor. So if we have this going on, right, then what schools are going to be able to get the highest quality players? Well, now we're thinking about a scenario where I'm holding the quality constant, right? I'm just looking at these high quality, this high, even one high quality player, what team can offer them the most? When we're talking outside of the NCAA, we're thinking about large market teams. So really at the collegiate level, it's just going to be whatever the highest revenue generating teams are. They're going to be able to offer the highest wage with the highest quality player. And so we would expect that we probably from this, you know, before, you know, maybe the amenities are a little bit nicer, um, but, you know, even uh, playing you know, D1 football here at Ball State, you know, relative to, I don't know, uh, Illinois or IU, it's not the biggest, it's, it's, there's not the biggest gap, right? And especially in terms of compensation, I'm pretty much getting the same thing from a high quality player. I'm getting the tuition remission, you know, whatever other, you know, minor um, amenities they can offer me. And maybe the amenities are a little bit nicer at IU, but, you know, it, it was a lot more comparable than if we allowed both those schools to pay a wage, right? IU is going to have a lot more resources, generate a lot more revenue per win than a ball state line. So if we allowed this free and open labor market, we probably would expect that competitive balance gets worse, right? These high revenue generating teams can afford the higher quality players. 
and we kind of see that that gap grow. Right? At least when only the teams can offer kind of this tuition remission, um, it kind of brings that gap a little bit closer together. Right? Any questions on that idea? It's not too crazy. It's kind of things we've already talked about just in the context of the NCAA. Um, I think I talked about this a little bit last class and I just kind of alluded to it, but these, you know, hypothetical changes you can see, you know, I don't think it's going out on a limb too much to expect that for your power five conference or these higher revenue generating programs, they're likely going to start acting like professional teams do, right? Profit maximizing, um, potentially, you know, paying, you know, players, whatever their value of the team is, or, you know, pretty high wages. Um, and then kind of your lower revenue schools probably still kind of operate as they do now as a, you know, they don't pay players. They are likely to kind of keep offering them the, the, that tuition remission because it's a zero cost to them. Um, and maybe they win maximize in order to kind of have some competitive, you know, ability or, or some, uh, some positive probability of actually competing with these higher level teams. Um, but we would probably see a divergence in the behaviors of high versus low revenue generating programs. Um, and this would work kind of very similar to the models we looked at last class, which were, you know, we compared football to bowling. Well, here, it's still going to be the marginal revenue per win that's going to determine, you know, the football team offers a wage, the bowling team gives the tuition remission. We'll just replace football team and bowling team with high revenue generating school versus low revenue, level, uh, low revenue generating school. The high revenue generating school, more likely to pay wages low revenue generating school, more likely to just offer that tuition remission. Okay. Um, we can kind of, I guess I can kind of set that up here real quick. It's just a, kind of a reminder of what that looks like. So it'll be in a slightly different context than what we were talking about last class, but it's gonna operate exactly the same, right? So if I'm thinking about these teams paying players, and I've got, my demand for labor that comes from the low generating program, my demand for labor coming from that high revenue generating program. And the reason why I know that's higher is remember because even for the same player, right? Same quality player, the marginal revenue per win is gonna be higher, you know, with these, these larger institutions, these higher revenue generating programs. So even if we assume that the supply of labor would be the same, to both of these schools, right? Um, like the marginal costs are the same to attend either one of these, then we could expect equilibrium wages to be significantly lower at that low revenue generating school. So now if we're thinking about comparing these to the value of a tuition remission, you know, maybe the tuition remission is somewhere like right here whatever its value would be. So if we're thinking about here, usually we would think about this as wage. Well, wage is really measured in kind of dollars here. So that tuition remission, it's kind of like it's a dollar amount, right? That we're gonna compare these wages to. So we could see here for the high revenue generating program, you know, if they offer just a tuition remission, that's not gonna be quite as high as what they could offer the player, you know, if they offer them a wage. And so they're not gonna get as many of these high quality athletes, if we think about it on an aggregate scale, or that you know, student athlete is just gonna choose to go to a different school, right? If I have more than one team that are able to offer them this wage. So you'll see these high revenue generating programs likely paying players an actual wage, while these low revenue generating programs, they look at this and say, if I offer them a wage, it's actually less than if I offer them this tuition remission. And so we'd see more of them be more likely to offer a tuition remission as opposed to kind of offering that player a wage. Yeah. And the tuition uh, mission for the low will only, it wouldn't be a cost for them if that player, right, wasn't going to the school to begin with. Yeah. Think about the two things that we need to be true for this tuition remission really to be at zero cost for the university. One, that that student wouldn't have went to the school otherwise, because if they would have, well, then they would have had to pay tuition, right? So now I'm losing out on all that. And then two, I can't have it capped so that it's forcing out another student who would have been paying tuition other, excuse me, otherwise. And we can complicate this model. Like I'm acting as though the tuition value here is the same for both of these schools. 
What's probably true is your higher revenue, revenue generating programs probably typically have a higher sticker price on tuition. So, you know, maybe I would actually have like two tuition remission values here. So it very well could be that even though wages are lower at these low revenue generating programs, they still offer players wages because if their tuition is also lower, so we'll call this, uh, this was at the high school. So here's our tuition remission at the low school. Well, under this scenario, both schools offer the wage, right? Now, I, I don't know. Tuition, is, the, the gap in tuition is, is uh, if we had the standard deviation or the variance on tuition costs for, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking kind of like football here, my guess would be that it's not near as large as the variation that exists in the revenue generation <laughs> if you look across football programs. So I doubt that this is really what the scenario would be, that the, the other school's tuition remission would be this much lower. But it's very possible that maybe it's like, you know, just slightly above the wage they could offer, or it could fall below. I mean, it just it kind of depends on the school, right? Each school is going to have a different tuition amount. Um, and it would just complicate the model of thinking about this is going to look a little bit different for every single school, right? But you would be making the same comparison. It would be where does this value of the tuition remission fall in relationship to where that equilibrium wages that the school could offer? Questions? Okay with that? All right. So. Yeah. So regarding the uh, one of the questions on the stage just today, like it was kind of just what we talked about. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that we could add the values and like the shape onto that real quick in the in the diagram? Like which one would be which? Uh, so for a number the of values. I say you'll have to re refresh my my memory yeah. of the values. It, it says that suppose the equilibrium wage at University A is seventy five thousand, and the value of a full tuition remission would be twenty five thousand. Okay. If, if player Z would not have attended the university without a wage and tuition remission, and there is no cap on enrollment, then which of the following is the op optimal compensation? Hmm. Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit last class, right? So what would the optimal scheme be? So remember, we're still looking at a labor market. So this equilibrium wage is really representing the last, like the lowest possible wage I could pay a player. So the lowest possible wage, and right, we even talked about last class, when I'm saying wage, we really can think about it more encompassing total compensation. So the total compensation, if I can give this player 75,000, I know that they'll supply their labor to me. So what I want to do, oh, sorry. What I want to do is offer them $75,000 total. Well, if I'm looking at this, and I know that my tuition remission is 25,000, right? But that's essentially a zero cost to me because I had those two conditions being true. So I'm going to offer them that tuition remission of 25,000, but that's not quite enough to get them to play yet, right? I guess technically I have to be greater than or equal to, right? So what can I do? Well, instead of paying them 75,000, I've already given them $25,000 value and compensation. So I can get away with offering them the tuition remission and just $50,000, right? That way I've minimized my cost, but still given that player the lowest possible wage they would have played for. Does that help make sense? Yeah, so this, yeah, I was getting at something that's slightly different here and, and kind of thinking about the idea, you know, if I would just offer a tuition remission, if that is above the wage, but if the wage is higher than the tuition remission amount, well, then I'm not just going to go ahead and pay the wage. If I'm allowed to pay the player a wage as well as give them a tuition remission, I can actually cut my cost and still offer that player. I'm, I'm still offering them the equilibrium wage, right? I'm giving them $75,000 in compensation, but I'm doing so in a way that cuts my costs. I just give them the tuition remission. And I know for sure they'll put they'll play, right? This player would have played for this low wage. So if I offer them this tuition, it, it, that's assuming the tuition remission is higher than that yeah, wage. I know they'll play for a total compensation of 25,000 because down here, the wage they would have played for is 15. 
But if that tuition remission has a value that's over 15,000, well then I'll just offer that. It's zero cost to me and I offer them something greater than or equal to the last wage they would have paid for. So, uh, let's think about this. Um, maybe this is cynical, but <laughs> here we can think about currently, like even if I can't offer players wages, right? Think about someone who, so let's say relatively low quality player, so pretty low demand. And let's, let's think about, this is gonna be not, this is like a, an extreme case, but I'm using extreme case to make a point about what, what's more likely for us to see in real life. Let's say that someone wants to play football so badly for the University of Michigan that it literally has zero, it comes at zero cost. You could pay them $0 right? Their compensation could be $0 and they would supply any amount of labor you want, right? You don't have to pay them at all and they will play as many, you know, they'll be at every practice hour, every single day, right? And it seems like an extreme scenario, but I mean, I don't think it's that far off from, you know, we see a lot of student athletes walk onto programs, right? I mean, they are getting some compensation there in terms of like they're getting an additional benefit from, you know, the amenities, you know, maybe some apparel, things like that. But really, like, they probably have a relatively, even though it's not zero, there's probably are some low quality players with a really, really flat supply curve. Right? So if that's the case, in this most extreme scenario, I know that my equilibrium wage is zero. So if I know this player is going to walk on, right, they, I, they'll provide their labor I don't even have to offer them a tuition remission. I don't even have to give them a scholarship, right? And so, you know, this is a little bit of an extreme scenario where it's zero, but even if it was a little bit positive, maybe just the value of the apparel, the benefit the player is getting from just belonging to the team, like, you know, enjoying you know, being in the stadium with the fans, potentially that, that value is above their equilibrium wage. Like their equilibrium wage just might be really, really low. And that's kind of what we say, see play. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't really have walk-ons, right? Or kind of players who were playing without a scholarship, right? Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about, like they can kind of exploit this fact that some supply curves for labor are going to be really, really flat. Right? Um, yeah. So like I said, this is... <laughs> A little bit of an extreme, but it's kind of like when we talk about inelastic or elastic goods, we can think about like the extreme cases and then kind of that spectrum in between. I doubt anyone has a completely flat supply curve, but you know, maybe their equilibrium wage is like, <clears throat> I don't know, they play for $500 a year or something like that. <clears throat> and um, another way to think about this, um, so really low wage. Right. So even if you, you, your tuition remission is like really, really low, like it just, you know, the value of the tuition remission is, I don't know, $1,500 or something over a semester, which that might seem ridiculous being at Ball State. But I don't know if you've ever seen the Netflix uh, or what is the um, last chance you, right? These like junior college JUCO programs are like out in the middle of nowhere. They're basically community colleges. Their tuition remissions aren't that valuable, right? They're, they're, not, they're not really worth that much. But the reason why is because the supply of labor is going to be so flat because those players going, the benefit they get, maybe it's not the apparel, maybe it's not, you know, living, you know, that even having their living paid for. What's a huge benefit to those players doing that JUCO program? It's not just wages. There it gets a little bit more complicated. It would be expected wages in the future, right? They attend these programs because they believe it'll get them into a D1 program or potentially get them to the NFL. So like it's built off of expectations, right? And so if they believe that going to this JUCO program might lead to higher expected wages in the future, well, then I'm, that jumps their equilibrium wage of, you know, that was relatively low because they had this flat supply. So 
I mean, think about kind of these things that we see in real life, like compensation, even if we don't pay a player a wage, it's really what's that value that you can offer that player, right? And sometimes that might even be expected wages. Now, that makes it more complicated to model, but it's definitely something that you could do, right? You just factor in not just the current wage, but expected wages into that total compensation value for the player as well. Any questions? I kind of when I didn't plan on doing that, but a little bit of an aside there. Any, any questions on that? Okay. Um, I mentioned this one last week or last week, last uh, class, and there's really no good way to measure this, but it's worth mentioning um, that there is something different about amateur and professional sports. And, you know, I would argue, I mean, maybe it's because we have some I don't know, emotional tie to it. And it's not every year. So there's pent up demand. Well, you know, it's always interesting to me how much more people care about track and field in the Olympics, right? The, the year of the Olympics, those people don't watch the, uh, you know, world uh, championships and track and field in the years in between, right? And so it, it, there is an aspect of watching amateurs versus professional that leads us to believe that demand is higher watching if you could hold constant the quality people might enjoy watching amateurs play a little bit more than, than professionals. You know, maybe there's this, you know, I mentioned here kind of this love of the game aspect. Um, you know, I've never seen, you know, I don't know if there's actually a really good way you could actually estimate this, like using some data because uh, you don't ever actually have the same players playing professionally and, am and amateur. Maybe you could tease it out because of this like one and done kind of, kind of deal. Um, but we, you know, this is primarily why college athletics doesn't want to adopt this kind of method of paying players that would look more like a professional kind of setting because they do believe, and they've even, I know it's like the, um, I don't think he's called a chairman, but the, the, the guy that's in, in control, the president or whatever, the NCAA uh, athletics has even said, you know, we believe that this would greatly decrease demand, right? We think that we would, you know, see a decrease in the benefit to consumers. And, um, you know, even if, and if we believe that competitive balance will get worse as, as well as a result of this, well, then that would impact our demand curve even more. And so that's why you see some resistance to this, right? There's a belief that the demand curve kind of overall for college athletics would decrease significantly if they opened it up and kind of didn't really didn't allow it to be an amateur sport anymore, but allowed it to be more of a professional. And that's not too hard to model, right? It's just a downward shift in our, our demand curve. Um, so I, I've thought of, haven't completely thought through all of uh, these, how they're going to play out here, but I, it, it is worth mentioning we're thinking about paying players, kind of some of, some of our Title IX concerns that we have as well. Um, so if we know that right away, the two highest revenue generating programs are men's football and men's basketball, well, automatically, if we start to think about allowing these programs to pay their players, well, we're going to see significant differences in, in the gender pay, right? I mean, we could just audit space, your two highest revenue generating sports happen to be you know, our, our men's sports, right? And, and so you know, we might have some issues there. Um, maybe, you know, some of these lower revenue generating sports we talked about with higher labor costs might be forced out of the market, right? If they aren't able to just kind of offer tuition remissions and then they had to pay these players a wage. Because I think that's some of the lawsuits that, that are being brought up. It's not that, you know, they don't appreciate the value of the tuition remission, but they believe they should be getting paid on top of it, right? And so if we force some of these, you know, who are the, the sports or who are the teams that are more likely to be pushed out? Lower revenue generating schools, lower revenue generating programs, and some of those, you know, maybe disproportionately female sports, right? So we might have some Title IX concerns there. Um, And it is a free and open labor market. Some of our title, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding of the way that it's written, that Title IX becomes problematic if we're thinking about these players being able to be paid. Because now I'm essentially, um, you know, how do I, 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 they're all student athletes. So how can I really get away with paying them different amounts if they are student athletes providing the same job? Is there some type of gender discrimination going on there? So they may scrap Title IX completely if they went to a model where they allowed teams and universities to just pay players completely, right? Now, none of this is, you know, it depends on exactly how they instituted this, this payment and allow what they allow universities to do. 
But if you went to a free and open labor market, right, you would think they would be subject to the, the laws that other companies would be. And we would probably have some Title IX concerns that we'd have to kind of work through there as well. Um, but I don't really have anything that I'm going to kind of model for. It's just kind of mentioning it. This is, is part of the broader picture, trying to think about every kind of component of what, you know, a change like this would look like. Um, also, like we've been thinking about wages. Um, I would imagine that they would have to cover all their student athletes on healthcare costs as well. Um, it is a university. If you've got over a certain number of employees, you, you have to, um, you know, you're required by law. And so this would be not just only wages paid to players. They now are going to have to pay for their health, healthcare insurance costs as well. Um, increasing that kind of labor cost even more, potentially forcing out more teams than if they didn't have to provide these as well. Um, I think I already mentioned this. I think I just accidentally had the had it twice. So we got thirty five. I really want to make sure we spend a little more time. So I want to go through these play or these um, papers. And if we have time, we'll come back to this. It's kind of starting to deviate a little bit from college athletics discussion in the labor market, um, and just more of an interesting kind of thing to think about with college athletics. So I I'll take a look at the quiz results, because I think I asked a couple, uh, the one quiz was just preference based on what topics we'll cover. I know that I saw a significant number of, of gambling, so I know that we'll go over some gambling topics and, and introduce a few papers. But today I thought kind of an interesting one, and let me see, I think I want to do the, the UK one first. Oops, which one's the UK one? Was this one? There we go, in England. So we've got, um, can, Switch gears here a little bit, right? So I really want to focus on thinking about how we interpret regression equation output and thinking about coefficients, what's statistically significant. This will kind of all help you as you're kind of working through the analysis section of the, of the project. Um, but also on the final, I may have some, you know, a question or two where you have to tell me a linear regression equation you would use to figure out a certain relationship or give you some output and have you make us some interpretations of some of the variables. So we've been doing this with these papers a lot, but I'll really try to kind of make sure we focus a little bit more here in the last couple of weeks on that. So these two papers have a generalized question, um, which I think is kind of interesting, which is, does participation in sports right, impact an individual's probability of committing crime? Right? And so this is primarily uh, thinking about kind of younger individuals uh, and you know, compared to the average age of, the, of a person in society. Um, and, you know, thinking about it as if they're participating in a sport, you know, maybe that's keeping them away from activities where they're more likely to get into trouble, more likely to commit crimes. And that was kind of, that's kind of the general hypothesis, right? Is it's more, it's more of a time use thing, right? There's only 24 hours in a day. If you're participating in a sport, that's going to take a lot of the time away from maybe getting into some adolescent mischief. Right. And so they were looking, I think, primarily this one was a UK data set. So they're looking at England. Let me see. We'll scroll down here. They had some measure of their sports participation. So it was just from a survey. So it is self-reported. So we always have to be a little bit, you know, you know, wary of the results here. But they kind of had these individuals report whether or not you know, they played a sport. And I think actually they even had the number of sports. They collected information on like their income or their parental income. So if you scroll down here, there we are, right? They didn't do this by individual, but they had this survey results. And then I think they did it by, I don't know what, what they would be, wouldn't be county, uh, re, okay, whatever the regions are called in, in the, right? And so they're kind of doing, if you want to think about it, it's easier. They were kind of doing this like by county, right? So what's the crime rate in the county? What's the sports participation rate in the county? What's the unemployment rate, income, average income? Um, and then how many young males are there, like the proportion of young males in that county, right? Um, because we know that if we look at crime rates, they differ quite a bit from, from men and women, right? So we wanna control for that. Now, don't worry about this LN idea. That's not something I'm gonna introduce into this class. Um, it's the natural log and it changes our interpretation. We'll just think about if they ran this without using these natural logs here, right? Because that's all I'm going to expect of you guys to do. Not know how to do things in units. Yeah. 
Um, so we won't have time series issues because notice nothing here on the right hand side is T minus one. So it's everything's in the current year. So it might as well be cross sectional data. It's actually panel data, right? So they've got a bunch of different counties, but then for every county, they've got 10 years. I forgot. It's not 10 years. I think it's like seven years or something, right? So they could do time series analysis with it, but they didn't do that because they haven't lagged anything here on the right hand side. And if you guys are wondering, it's an econometrics class question. So don't, I won't expect you to know anything about that, but that is a good, good thing, thing to be thinking about. Okay. Um, and then they controlled for the, the percent that was in kind of this younger, younger age range. So we'll scroll down here for the results of that regression equation, which are right here. Right? So they broke this down into two things. Two things. Property crimes. And their other table, they have kind of personal crimes, right? Or these would be more things like um, you know, assault or something like that, right? And then property crimes, theft, right? Breaking entry. So there might be a difference in there. And we'll look at the results. We can maybe kind of think of, of the stories that would line up with the results that we see. So here, their dependent variable was partis, or sorry, their dependent variable was property crimes. And the variable that they were interested in was this kind of participation in sports variable. So if we go over here and kind of write out this regression equation. So they had property crimes. As a function of this participation in sports rate plus all these other control variables, right? So the interpretation of beta one here, and I'd have to go back, I believe that they have participation as a percentage, right? So this like would go from zero to hundred. So a one unit increase in this participation variable would mean that if sports participation goes up by 1%, right? Or that's our one unit because it's being measured as a percent, then property crimes go up or down, depending on the sign of that coefficient, by beta one, right? Or a thing about said differently, it's the predicted change in property crime rates from a one unit increase in our participation in sports rate. Okay? So I don't remember if they're percentages. I think they might actually both be in proportions. So the idea would be if it goes up by 1%, it would be like an increase of, in the proportion of 0 0.01. Okay. So when we look here, we kind of notice that there's a negative effect from this, right? So as the sports participation increases in a county, the property crime rates actually decrease, right? So keeping you know, these kids involved in the sport, you may see them less likely to be, or I say kids, this is also, I think they went for 24, like as their young group. So young adolescent, kind of young adults, right? That if they're participating in a sport, that if sports participation in an area is higher, it's let, you know, crime rates would go predicted to be, be lower. Um, and they've got three stars on each one of these coefficients. So each one of these columns is a separate regression. So this first one, it was just very naive. They just ran it, no control variables, just one variable on that right-hand side. Well, we know that other things matter and that you, you know you should control for them. So they start to include more and more things as they progress throughout these models. Um, but kind of similar effects, even after they start adding in some of these controls, right? And everything's very significant, the three stars remembering, we've got three different levels of confidence or three different significance levels that we can say things like that. So if I've got, my p-value associated with this coefficient. Right? I want to compare that to whatever my threshold alpha is. This is some 221 stuff. So really all you're doing there is you've got three different levels for alpha, which correspond to what we call statistical significance levels. So that's just the percentage form basically of alpha. And then our confidence levels, if you want to think about it that way, 
are going to be whatever gets us to 100%. So the significance is kind of like the proportion of, or the percent of times we'll be wrong. Confidence is the percent of times that we'll be right. Well, I'm either right or wrong. So 1% significance is 99% confidence level. 5% actually, I wrote these backwards. Sorry. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Someone should have said something. I definitely did them in the back, uh, reverse order. There we go. So 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.1 is 1, 5, and 10%, right? Which is 99, 95, and 90% confidence. Sorry about that. Just talking too much without looking at what I was doing. So when we see three stars, right, that denotes the highest level of confidence, two stars, 95, and one star, 90. So if we had three stars next to those coefficients, what we were really saying is, I can say that there's a significant relationship between property crime rates and participation in sports rates with 99% confidence, right? And let's say that that relationship is different from zero, that it, a relationship exists with 99% confidence. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at this too. Like you notice, and these other things kind of make sense, right? As the unemployment rate goes up, so there's more people out of work, it's more likely we see property crimes. Um, and when we say property crimes, this is primarily being driven through like burglary, break breaking and entering. When income is higher in an area, we see lower property, that makes sense, right? Um, the more young males, uh, property crime rates are a little bit higher, although not, we don't have any stars here, so we can't say that it's any different from zero. Although if I'm looking at, I believe that they've got, these can't be the p-values, these must be our standard errors. This is probably really close. Um, I always like uh, papers, I wish it was more convention. So instead of showing you the coefficient value and the standard error, sometimes papers will show you the coefficient and then the p-value, which is a lot more useful because if I can see here, the p-value is like 0.12, okay, well, yeah, it's barely not significant, right? It's just barely above that 0.1 threshold. Um, and this one, just looking at the numbers, it's probably pretty close to, to being significant. Um, do I wanna go through that? We'll hold off on this in just a second, this interaction term. So kind of the findings here, even holding constant the income, unemployment, and young male rate in a county, if sports participation rates go up, we see property crime rates go down. Okay. Now, if I look at what they call person crimes, right? Or these are things like assault or, or you know, um, I don't know, what, what, what would we think there? Like uh, assault and battery, or I don't know. Thing, thing, actually, let's go, let's see exactly what they define it as. I know they had it up here. Uh, da, 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 da. Should be in the data section where they describe what data they have. So, not sports participation. Hmm. I would have thought they had had it better defined somewhere. This is the problem with skimming papers sometimes. All right, let's see if they've got something down here. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter what the list is, but kind of thinking about these are likely crimes that are that are more aggressive crimes towards another individual. So if we looked at the impact there of participation rate in sports, it does look like it also decreases those types of crimes as well. Right. Um, what's interesting is that for income, the effect goes away. So, you know, when it comes to kind of these more aggressive crime it looks like it doesn't matter what your economic condition is um you know you don't have to assault someone in order to to feed yourself but you know potentially robbery is a more enticing type of crime when you have lower income in order to feed yourself and then survive right so that's kind of interesting that comes out of it also it's a little bit interesting that uh, as the unemployment rate goes up here um you actually have fewer person like personal crimes um i don't know if this is some sort of like a camaraderie effect where uh, if unemployment rates are high, we, we generally you know, realize that other people are, are going through tough conditions as well. And you see kind of um, fewer crimes between individuals. Um, there's a lot of things we're missing in this, in this regression in terms of controls to really make that statement. But it is kind of interesting to look at. 
Um, and we'll come back to this after the second paper if we have enough time. But you know, it is it is kind of interesting to see that even you know this survey data, you know, self-reported participation in sports looks like it has some relationship with both property and personal forms or personal drives. Now, I like this paper because it's pretty easy regression output to look at. Um, this one is very similar idea. They use some US data and they're really trying to estimate the same impact, right? So here they're looking at only adolescents or only people in high school, young or younger, but they're setting up a very similar sort of, here we go, sort of regression. Well, it's kind of interesting. So they're using survey data as well. And they their dependent variable is going to be some type of crime rate, right? Or committing crimes or not. Now, they've got, instead of county level data, they have individual level data, right? So they have this survey data and they can see each individual's response, not just grouped by county. So they've got like, not crime, just crimes. I think they call this delinquency, right? So these are like, I mean, ever lied to parents. Like, I don't know how the mean is not, you know, 100%, I don't know how it's not 100%, but we've got like all these different measures of things that, that maybe are, are delinquent behaviors, right? Um, also, this one is wild to me. Was drunk at school is like 7%, my, my God. So, I mean, uh, if we scroll down here, they then categorized all these different types of delinquencies, okay? So they didn't want a regression, want to run a regression for every single different possible delinquency, but they categorized them as a general delinquency, less serious, more serious, and then they had one that was problems with alcohol. I don't even think they used that in any of their results, so I don't know why they created that, but those are going to be kind of our dependent variables. So here, instead of like rates, well, our dependent variable is just going to be, did, you know, did they have a general delinquency or not, a one or a zero, okay? Now, just looking at kind of the averages for the student athletes or the individuals that participated in, in some type of sport versus students who didn't, we can kind of just look at the averages like a little bit higher, it looks like for the athletes. Right? But maybe, you know, being an athlete is correlated with you know, a bunch of other variables that would actually predict the delinquency. Now, I don't think this is necessarily the case, but like, let's say having lower, uh, coming from a lower socioeconomic background, having lower income, makes it more likely you play athletics. Well, then if I'm just looking at the averages, then yeah, it's gonna look like athletes commit crimes more often because we know that that relationship between income and crimes exists, right? We saw in the, the previous paper that higher income meant that there was fewer crimes. So lower income, I mean, it's more likely they commit crime. So we don't wanna just look at the average because we can control for these things, right? So we're gonna run these different regressions. So, excuse me, they run two different models for each different type of dependent variable. So here the dependent variable is that general delinquency category. So I'm guessing in this one was probably things like, did you lie to your parents? Or this, you know, kind of the pretty lackadaisical things. We then have less serious and then more serious as our dependent variable. So for each one of these dependent variables, there's two models. And I think in the second model, they included some measure of risk taking. So they, they had some results on this survey um, they do this a lot, and I don't think, I don't know if you, if you guys ever done like any, um, just out of curiosity, I know the psychology department was doing stuff even in, in our econ hallway a couple years ago, but have you ever done any like experiments on campus with psychology? I know that we have a room here that I think marketing uses a lot. You guys heard of this opportunity? Maybe I'll try to bring something in on Tuesday for it, because I know that the marketing department has, um, I think it's on the third floor. Uh, a room where they do some experiments, right? So I don't, you know, no one here in the econ department does economics experiments, but it's a whole subset of economics where you bring people in and all the time you have a general question at the beginning where they like choose certain things so that you can determine how risk averse or risk taking are they, right? And so, you know, that's a good measure to have when you're thinking about things like crime, because generally crime is done in, in high risk activity, right? There's a high reward, but there's also a high risk, right? If I rob a bank, there's a huge, huge reward, but there's a very high risk there as well, okay? So they want to control for that. So if we look here, you know, I, I thought this one was kind of funny to look right at the top. 
no matter what type of delinquency we're thinking about. So, right, our dependent or our left-hand side variable is, the, is delinquency. Here's all of our control variables on the right-hand side. So as somebody gets one year older, they're less likely to commit crime, or, or sorry, they're less likely to have any of these delinquencies, right? So like wisdom comes with age kind of thing. Um, come down here, where is it? Here we go. So what's interesting about these results is they had this, okay, it's a one zero variable. If you played one sport or, you know, if you were an athlete who played one sport, this is a one. If you were an athlete who played zero, or sorry, more than one sport, or you weren't an athlete, then this is a zero. And then they have another identifier for a one. If you played two or more sports, zero otherwise. So kind of our control group is someone who doesn't play, isn't involved in any sports. Here's the impact of playing one sport on this delinquency. And here's the effect of playing two or more sports on the predicted kind of probability of committing some type of delinquency. And I say probability. So Whenever we have, so here we had like delinquency, and this was just a one zero. And then we had our intercept, and then the variable we were interested in was like, were they, a, I guess, one sport athlete? And then we also had two or more sport athlete. And these were also just one zeros. Well, we said these are capturing everyone who isn't an athlete. So our control group here are like non-athletes. So going from the zero to the one group, whenever we have a one zero variable, our one unit increase is going from a zero to a one. So relative to not being an athlete, if I was in one sport, the predicted change in my Y variable would be whatever beta one is. However, if my Y variable is a zero one variable, then the predicted change is like an increase or decrease in the probability I go from a zero to a one. Because those are the only two outcomes I can see. So we're talking about it increases the probability I'm a one. Right? So if we looked at those results, the increase in the probability of kind of committing some general delinquency or one of those things they categorize as a general delinquency, doesn't, there's no real statistically significant effect here. Although it's not very helpful. They don't show us the p-values or the standard errors, so I have no idea how close this was. Yeah. Oh, yes. So these are kind of their thresholds. So they show you a star. That means you know the p-value was less than 0.1. My point was that when something isn't significant, I don't know how far away from 0.1 that that p-value was. Does that make sense? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, they're being very scrupulous. Yeah, they're being, you're right. They're being really, uh, um, I don't know, setting very high thresholds, right? This is what, 90, so here's 99, 99.5, and 99.9% .9 confidence. So they're wanting to be able to say things at very high levels. You're right. So yeah, it may in fact be significant, but I don't know because they haven't shown me the p-value or the standard error for me to compute it myself. But it is positive and it's consistently positive across all measures and all types of delinquency. So that is interesting, right? We can't statistically, well, we don't know, but we, given these rate or these levels, we can't say statistically that there's any effect there or that's different from zero. But it is, you know, provides some evidence that it has a positive effect. Wait, playing that sport actually has a positive effect or an increase in the probability that I commit these delinquencies, this kind of goes against the other paper that we we're looking at. Now, the other paper was measuring crimes, like things that, uh, you know, are put on your record. These, even the more serious delinquencies here, these are all like, we go back, right? These are all activities that, I mean, ever stole a car seems a little wild, but for most of this, right, these aren't things that are, are going to send you to jail, right? Or that are, are fairly common. So, you know, I, I think um, it, or did I skip through? There we go. It's interesting that this is positive, although I don't think that this necessarily means we can draw the conclusion that participating in sports is going to send someone to jail here, 
Uh, this is our, these are like lower measures of pound delinquency than the other paper. Um, and actually, if they play two or more sports, it looks like that this is even actually becomes significant. And the a size of the effect is quite a bit higher for every type of delinquency. <clears throat> so this is kind of a good example. This paper, I was reading a little bit of their conclusions, uh, preparing to, to talk about a little bit today. And they're like crying about their results, basically, because they, they set up these hypotheses and they found this thing that goes against this idea that if you're involved in sport, it's more likely to keep you away from, you know, more nefarious activities. And, uh, it's, it's, you know, how do we get this funny? The data is what it is. I mean, you can have your preconceived notions. And even as you're thinking about your project question, you know, first of all, to be honest, we, we are using very basic regression techniques, right? And there is going to be some bias that exists. So we have to take everything we see with a grain of salt. But also, just because you think this is how something's going to work, if the data shows you otherwise, it just is what it is, right? And so, um, you know, I don't know. I thought that was a little bit uh, interesting reading it. But we do find a positive effect here. It probably does go against kind of conventional wisdom that for these, like, less serious, they're not really crimes. They're just kind of things that we probably wouldn't want our kid to be doing. Um, looks like maybe playing sports increases those rates. You know, what are the reasonings there? Um, if I had to take a stab at it, uh, it would be something about, you know, I, I would love to see this differentiated between male and females. <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine that these delinquency rates, I, I think that males are probably driving this, right? Just getting a, a 10, 10 or more uh, high school males in the same area is probably generally not going to always produce the best results. Um, but they didn't do that. They didn't kind of investigate that. But I think that would be an interesting kind of addition to this paper is kind of to look at it by gender. Um, and then also it would be interesting if you had the same individuals where you could take measures of delinquency, but also use more serious measures of like, well, were, were, did they commit a crime that they were arrested for? Because I don't think we're necessarily gonna be near as concerned if the delinquencies increase, but crimes are actually going down, right? I think we'd be okay seeing delinquency or these like things that aren't as serious go up if we can get crime yeah yeah right they're they're by yeah yeah you're gonna be out more i mean you just look at like for instance ever took part in a physical fight. If you're on a football team in high school, my guess is that might increase, right? So, so some of this is probably they could have done a better job about thinking about, well, we don't have to use all of these, right? We could select a few that we're really concerned about and then label those more as like the delinquencies that we would actually care about. Um, I would love to see this. I, I, I actually, I, after reading this, I know how to, I know how to access this database. So in the future, I may try to recreate this paper and do it for a little bit more of these interesting things, right? So you can actually look at uh, what the serious delinquencies kind of how, the, how they were impacted. Any other questions or comments or, I mean, to scroll down that far, where's that table at? There we are. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I, I always think that I like looking at these papers. I find them interesting, um, but I'm trying to kind of talk through the linear regression stuff there. I'm, I'm always, you know, we did a kind of a little intro at the beginning of this course. So if, if you kind of, you know, have forgotten some of it and you ever have questions, feel free to let me know as you're kind of working on your projects. But really, I, I you know, I'm wanting us to realize that we can estimate some pretty interesting relationships using this regression analysis technique. Um, and also be able to look at other people's regression output and determine the relationship between their dependent variable and whatever their variables of interest on the right hand side are. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've got the three like, models that you're using. Mm -hmm. So, like model one in general, and then is model two. Yeah, this is like one I, zero. Yeah, so if we go up here. This is going to be me being kind of mean, but 
this is from the journal Sociological Focus. I, the, so a lot of the papers I show you, unfortunately, are not economics papers because an economist would have done things that are outside the scope of this class. Sociologists actually do things that you guys, like, like at the high level, are doing things that you probably in the business school can already do, like statistically. Um, and so they didn't set it up very well, but the way that it should be is it should say like general delinquency, merge these two cells. So model one and two, we're using the dependent variable of general delinquency. Model three and four, we're using this dependent variable of less serious delinquency. So I don't know why they didn't put model three down here and then like merge these two cells and put that over. It would make way more sense and explain the table a lot more. But yeah, it's like each group of two was using the same. So these two, the dependent variable is more serious delinquencies, like one or zero if they, they had one or not. Three and four were the less serious delinquency. One and two was just this general delinquency category they created. Is that kind of what you were getting at? Yeah, like why is the percentage given? What, what oh, so here they included this risk in every single second model. They included this additional variable of risk taking. I don't know why they thought it was going to be that important. I mean, it it does change the estimates, but I mean, not by very much. Like if you're going to do something like this, generally it's to show the importance of an added variable. So. Um, I actually can show you an example. Let's go down here. So tables, and I'll zoom in in a second. So this is what they were trying to do. I don't, but they did it with a variable, it doesn't matter. So a lot of the times, they won't even show you what the variables are. They're just trying to make a point that as I add in more controls, I can get it. Because if I'm leaving out things that are important, my coefficient is going to maybe be picking up the effect of some of those things I left out, right? If they're correlated with whatever variable I have there on the right-hand side. So for instance, um, this is one of my papers where we were looking at that hot hand. And so here's my estimate for the effect of making the previous free throw. And the dependent variable is always, did I make my current free throw? So as I include things like game controls, notice, oh, okay, I decrease my estimate a little bit. And then player controls. So these are things like height, weight, uh, years of experience. And then shot controls. Where was the shot taken on the court? What was the distance from the rim? These other things. And you basically start adding in more and more controls to finally show like which ones have the largest effect. Like if I look here, ooh, there's a pretty big gap. It's like cut it in half. So, okay the player's free throw percentage not in the current game apparently was really important to control for. And that makes sense if I'm looking at the probability of making free throws, right? So um, generally that's why you would do something like that. They simply added that risk-taking variable in, didn't change things very much. So I don't know why it got left in the final version of the paper. They probably could have just done three columns, right? Um, but yeah, that was a good question. Any other questions? So um, if you, so that homework assignment is due at the end of the day next Tuesday. If you want to turn it in class, a hard copy, that's fine. If you want uh, any of your homeworks back, like the hard copy versions, I've, I've got them, by the way. Um, I will be getting an answer key up to that third homework assignment. I've got it written now. I just need to scan it and upload it after class here. Uh, and then after the due date for the fourth homework, I'll do a similar thing there. Those would be good things to kind of go back through as you're kind of preparing as we get closer and closer to that final exam. Um, other than that, I will see you guys on Tuesday.